Hello, welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, I want to look at the life and the ministry of William Seymour and, of course, the Azusa Street Revival. Maybe you're like me and you desire another fresh move of the Holy Spirit, and you're crying out for Azusa now. You want to see what they saw during those days, the power, the presence of the living God, and the lives changed and brought into the kingdom. But are we willing to pay the price that William Seymour paid? So I pray in the name of Jesus that this would be a lasting word, a now word that would bless, inspire, encourage, and challenge you. I pray, Father, that we would look at what was done right and what was done wrong so that we can be catapulted into our high call and that we would step up to the plate and serve this generation as William Seymour served his in the name of Jesus. I look at William Seymour, one of the questions I ask is, how did he do it? He got believers, black and white, in all nationalities to come together under the blood of Jesus, filled with a holy provocation and desperation, seeking God for a fresh move of the Spirit, knocking and continuing to knock, seeking and continue to seek, and asking until heaven moved. Despite all that was going on, all the racial issues, he got them together under the blood. We build up walls that Jesus paid a price to bring down. And God wants a church united together, believers, blood-bought, that have a now relationship with Jesus, coming together as one. And when we look at history, revivals are birth when you get believers together as one. Well, William Seymour was born in Centralville, Louisiana, on May 2, 1870. He was born to Simon and Phyllis Seymour, who obtained freedom from slavery because Simon fought in the African-American volunteers. It still was at a time of extreme uh, oppression, and even more than that, the blacks were tortured, uh, they were lynched, they were treated inhumanely. So we have to understand the environment in which um, Seymour was brought up. Uh, it could have and should have truly tainted him against ever connecting and working with white people. It was horrendous at that time. Well, William Seymour was baptized a Roman Catholic in September 1870 because it was mandatory uh, that you be raised Catholic. He had no formal education and in fact he only learned to read through reading the Bible, which was typical in that time period. Seeking to get away from all this, Seymour would leave and move to Indianapolis in 1896. He went there because racial tensions, racial issues were lower, and he would work at three different hotels as a waiter. But it was during this time that he would join the Simpson uh, Episcopal Methodist Church, and he has a conversion experience. He discovers and meets the Lord Jesus. He also discovers and grows in love with John Wesley and the Wesleyan teaching. He loves the message of holiness, which he would run with for the rest of his life. However, tensions, racial tensions, started to fester up and grow. 
And so in 1900, William Seymour actually went to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I want you to see that in each step, God has an appointment with him to prepare him and to work on him uh, for the Azusa Street Revival. When he gets to Cincinnati, he joined a Bible school for a short period under a man called Knapp. And Knapp was against racism, and Knapp also believed in special revelations, which was very strong to Seymour. And he also believed in a premillennial message. In other words, um, like Seymour, they believed in Jesus physically returning to the earth before a millennial reign. This is important to Seymour. As you'll see, even at Azusa, they believed strongly, and Jesus was coming soon. Well, Seymour would then join the Evening Saints Light, or sorry, Evening Light Saints Church. And it's a very strict holiness church where they, you know, you, you're controlled on what you can wear. Um, and they didn't allow instruments, for example, in their worship. This would become something that would strongly influence Seymour moving forward. During this time, Seymour starts to feel the burden for the call, and he begins to wrestle with it because he doesn't know if he really wants to go into ministry or not. He ultimately would come down with smallpox, and he would suffer for several weeks in terrible pain, and at the end of it, he would have a terrible scar and have blindness in his left eye. He felt this was the Lord chastising him for not going into ministry. So he agrees, he gets ordained by the Evening uh, Light Saints Church, and he begins to become an itinerant evangelist, just like Wesley. He's prepared to pray, to uh, preach, and to die for this gospel. He also believes strongly in a message of living by faith. So he doesn't have a job. He is basically trusting the Lord will meet his needs if he goes. And that's where his family was at this point. He has a divine appointment in Houston with a lady called Lucy Farrell. Now, Lucy Farrell was a holiness preacher, and she is a church that Seymour joins. Now, at this time period, a lot is going on in America. There's a lot of Pentecostal things going on. We have, for example, Mariah Woodworth Edder going around the country preaching, and her Diary of Signs and Wonders, which was um, wrote before Azusa demonstrates or talks about Azusa-like comments, statements, but again, this is before Azusa. She was very Pentecostal and saw great Pentecostal manifestations in her ministry. You have Benjamin Irwin. He is a holiness man that is preaching a baptism of fire. You have Alexander Dowie, another holiness person, um, that is now preaching that he has the gifts and that he's the first apostle, even though he never did go Pentecostal. Then, of course, you've got Charles Parham. Charles Parham is not just preaching a baptism based on the holiness message, but he's talking about a baptism with the Holy Spirit with evidences speaking in tongues. And then, of course, the manifestation of gifts. So this is new, this baptism where there's the evidence of speaking in tongues. And of course, he's got his Bible school in Topeka, but he's traveling around and he came to Houston. He holds a campaign in Houston and he meets Lucy Farrell and they connect and he invites Lucy Farrell to come join and be his governess in his Topeka home. So she leaves and goes to Topeka for a few months and leaves William Seymour in charge. When she returns, she brings back this message of the baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And Seymour is not fully sure if he accepts it or not. He, has to, he struggles with it, but eventually he agrees to go and connect with Charles Parham, who now starts a Bible school in Houston. Well, of course, the Jim Crow laws prevented the mixing uh, of whites and blacks at a school or any place like that. 
And so there's a problem now is that William Seymour is black and the other students are white and they cannot be in the same room. So they ultimately come up with this uh, design where William Seymour will sit in another room with the door open so that he can hear what's taught, but he's not in the room with them. He goes through the several weeks, five or so weeks of training, and at the end of it, he feels burdened to start a Pentecostal church preaching the message of Charles Parham. <clears throat> he is now fully persuaded that there should be a baptism of the Holy Spirit with tongues, even though at this point he still does not have it. At this time period, several things are going on globally and in California. Of course, we have the Welsh Revival under Evan Roberts that occurred late 1904 through 1905. This has stirred a real desire in many to see revival because the newspapers are covering this incredible event in Wales. Believers are beginning to cry out and get the fire for revival. In California, you see, number one, it was a state that was more accepting of race. You have a lot more people of different nationalities, different colors, all merging in Los Angeles. We see people like Frank Bartleman, who was a man influenced by Dowie, met with Dowie. He has come believing in a message of the Holy Spirit moving with power. He is a man committed to prayer. You see John or Joseph Smile, and he was a Baptist preacher, preacher uh, that was raised in Spurgeon School in London, believes strongly in revival, wants to see it, and believes strongly in a baptism of the Holy Spirit based on the holiness message. He uh, ultimately would start his own church, and they begin to pray and cry out for revival. They start to experience and taste the reign of revival in their services. But he experiences great uh, warfare, and he becomes sick and wore out, and he decides to go on a trip uh, to the Holy Land, Holy Land in 1905. On his way back, he actually stopped, and he saw the Welsh Revival. Now, there are stories that he met with Evan Roberts. Um, we can't be sure, but he did go to the Welsh Revival, and it did stir him that when he came back, there was a great expectancy in the people for revival. Frank Bartleman wrote to Evan Roberts, and Evan Roberts wrote back to him. And he said, Frank Bartleman, that he felt he had faith, the gift of faith given to him to believe and pray for revival in California. There's also this other group, under a Julie Hutchinson, a holiness group, part of a Baptist church that are kicked out based on their extreme holiness messages. One of their members um, would go to Houston and she heard Seymour preaching and she loves it and they're looking for a leader. And so Julia Hutchins invites Seymour to come and preach for them. So Seymour feels this is a divine appointment. And so he heads in uh, beginning of 1906 to Los Angeles. He comes there to Julie Hutchinson's church and he preaches a message uh, of holiness, um, the um, return of the Lord, and then he starts to preach on tongues. And this is where the problem begins. People are not sure if they receive it or not. Some are totally opposed and some are open. Julie Hutchinson believes it is error and it is not right and she doesn't want her little church exposed to this message. And so when William Seymour leaves to go get some food on Sunday, uh, she padlocks the door, so when he returns, he discovers these doors padlocked and he has nowhere to preach, nowhere to go. He has no money in his pocket, so he is stuck. But the Lord stirred the heart of a man called Lee, and the Lee family invite Seymour to come and live in their house and to have regular meetings. So Lee goes there and he begins to pray and to fast, and at this time period, you know, he's been praying about five hours a day. And he's like, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord says, pray more. And so he's even praying more. And he ultimately invites Lee and his family to join him in these prayer sessions. 
People hear about it, and of course, they are burdened and stirred. They're seeking revival. They hear about what's going on in, in wells, and they know that came about by prayer. And so they start to gather in increasing numbers at um, Lee's house. Around this time, William Seymour calls for a 10-day period of praying and fasting to seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking of tongues. And several are part of that group. Frank Bartleman would be part of this group. They are seeking the Lord uh, on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles. A few days later, so this was over the weekend, and on Monday, Lee comes to um, William Seymour and says, could you pray for me for healing? And William Seymour prays over him and he gets healed and all of a sudden he starts to speak in tongues. It is April 9th, 1906. So they go to the Asbury house on Bonnie Bray where everybody's gathered, They're, every room is filled, they're praying and seeking the Lord and crying out for revival. And Seymour goes in and he tells the testimony of Lee and how he was sick, how they anointed and prayed with him, and how he got healed. But more importantly, how he got filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with tongues. Well, immediately, a Jenny Moore, a black lady who played the piano and ultimately became Seymour's wife, began speaking in tongues. And a Florence Crawford, a white lady, begins speaking in tongues. In fact, about six or seven people would start speaking in tongues. Well, they get excited. They go into the streets. They're prophesying, speaking in tongues. It's an incredible meeting. And over the next few days, uh, it continues. And on the third day, William Seymour actually got the baptism himself. He is now speaking in tongues. And people are now becoming more aware. They're starting to gather. The newspaper's aware of this event. And so people are just in, in, in awe and trying to discover what is this baptism and what is this speaking in tongues? Well, the numbers become too great, so they have to preach, or Seymour has to preach on the porch. And the porch is not even able to hold the people uh, without it collapsing. So they decide they're going to have to move. And this is where they go looking for a building. And they discover 3112 Azusa Street, this old abandoned African Methodist uh, church. And it's just right, it's not in great condition, needs a lot of love, but this is the building they choose. And I believe it was a Catholic man that came in and helped fix this place up uh, to make it ready for them to come in very quickly and hold services. In the church, it was all at one floor, or one level. And there was no raised part for the pulpit because Seymour believed everyone, everyone was equal. He wanted everybody to come there and worship the Lord together. He believed, and the, the blood of Jesus washed away all lines of racism. And so what you see in this place is people of every color, every nationality coming with a holy desperation, seeking the Lord. And the Lord began to pour out His Spirit in a very powerful, tangible way. Well, the newspapers are intrigued, and on the uh, 17th of April, they turn up, and there's a man prophesying that a warning of judgment wrath was coming to Los Angeles, and they would print it in the newspaper the next day, the 18th of April. 
Well, that was the day, of course, of the great San Francisco earthquake where thousands were killed. And reading this in the newspaper, hearing about this caused hundreds of people to run to the Azusa Street Church. Now, instead of just having hundreds in the room, they are packed completely. They have about 800 in there and they have about 500 in the streets. I mean, you cannot find any other space in the building. It is crammed. You have to line up to get into this building. And God is moving powerfully. You couldn't duplicate it, said, the anointing on Seymour. Only if God graced you with that anointing could you flow in it. So there was a very powerful, tangible anointing on Seymour. And he would preach uh, occasionally. It was very much like Evan Roberts. So there wasn't always a lot of teaching. It varied, uh, but there was a lot of freedom of the Spirit. And people allowed a spontaneity. Seymour believed in order, but he wanted a freedom of the Spirit like with Evan Roberts. And with Evan Roberts, of course, they didn't go in with their hymn books and let's sing hymn this or that. They would all begin to sing the same hymn, some in English, some in Welsh, at the same time. You see a similar thing going on in Azusa, but of course, they're not singing in Welsh. Uh, but they would sometimes speak, speak in tongues, sing in tongues, pray in tongues, and they'd all be flowing together. They talked about that they would hear this worship that came from heaven. There was a very tangible presence of the living God, and there was almost like a glow. Uh, firemen once came in looking for the fire because they saw the building on fire to discover it wasn't. You know, people begin to get dramatically healed. People come out of wheelchairs. People with tumors see the tumors drop off and they have to brush them off the floor every day. I mean, it was an incredible event where people are getting saved, healed, delivered, and baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, some of these miracles may sound outlandish, but people would testify of them for a very long time afterwards and even be recorded on TV many years later telling of the stories, the testimonies, the healings, and what happened in this small, little, slum-like church. It was a, they talked about it being a barn, um, a, like a manger, and that how Jesus came the first time in a manger, and like here, this move of the Spirit comes in this humble little shack manger. But God began to move incredibly powerfully in this place. William Seymour, then begins a newspaper, The Apostolic Faith. This newsletter would go global, and the people that would sign up would be, uh, grow rapidly, and it would help expand the influence of the Apostolic Faith mission, which was the name he gave the church. That was to honor his spiritual father, Charles Parham. they start to see these incredible manifestations. And we have got to realize that at every revival, historically, there has been manifestations, and manifestations become the issue. People do not want to grieve the Holy Spirit, which was the same thing at the Azusa revival. They weren't sure, is this all of God or not? They recognized in Azusa that there were certain manifestations that were demonic, and as a result, they tried to stop them, but when they tried to stop them in and of themselves, they said it was like trying to steady the ark. They, it was not a good thing. And so a fear came upon a lot of people that they were terrified of receiving an evil spirit. Now, when I look at these manifestations, and again, they have occurred. You can go to the Ulster Revival, 1625, and I have a video on that. You can go to Campbell Slang or Kilsith Revivals in 1740s in Scotland. You could go to the Kentucky Revival, 1800. You could go under Wesley's revivals. And you see incredible manifestations. I'm just list a few. Where people often would be so struck with the Holy Spirit that they would realize their desperate need of salvation and begin to just cry out in absolute agony. People would fall at the altar as if dead. And when you looked in this room, a lot of time it was like a forest where all the trees were being cut down. They said very similar things of Kentucky. It was like a battlefield where people were just shot and struck down by the Holy Spirit. 
so strongly, deeply convicted. People start to go in trances, and, which occurred in other revivals. Speaking in tongues occurred in these other revivals. Um, prophesy, etc., have visions. This is all going on. And at the same time, you're also seeing in Azusa, hypnotists, spiritualists coming in and trying to influence the meeting. Seymour would receive a lot of criticism because he failed to basically be a voice of leadership to deal with these spiritualists and these hypnotists. He believes in this, just pray about it and pray they go. If you've ever held a revival, if you've ever been in ministry and held a church, you'll often find these type of people try to come and they try to destroy what God is doing. And it's important to be able to step up as a leader and be a voice and do something about it. Because if you look in the book of Revelation, you know, Jesus said, talks, you tolerate Jezebel. You know, you have to deal with it. And that was the problem. Seymour didn't. Well, you have all these manifestations going on and it's disturbing some. And again, there's a burden inside of them that they don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. In previous revivals, when they stopped the manifestations, the revival began to decline. The impact, the influence on the lost dropped. And so there is a fear, there's a concern. In these services, there was a freedom given so that you, if you felt anointed to preach or to teach, you could get up and preach. But you better be anointed because there was someone there that if you did not have an anointing, would tell you and pull you down. So there was a fear on the people that you didn't preach or teach or give a word unless you really knew it was of the Lord. But there was an incredible freedom in those services. They went on every day where people would get up and testify, share, and they would preach and teach. And so there just was this grouping together of people of every color, every nationality, a melting pot. And what started to happen is people started coming from all over the world. These people would take the message of Pentecostalism to their countries. You have people like Alan Boddy who came over from Britain. This began his journey of discovering Pentecostalism uh, and he ultimately would bring it to Britain and of course bapt his wife would baptize a man called Smith Wigglesworth. There was another man that went to Canada and would meet with a man called Robert Semple. Robert Semple got baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and he went on to marry, of course, Amy Semple McPherson, who would start the Foursquare um, Church. Several denominations directly or indirectly can point their formation out of this revival. One of them was the Church of God in Christ, where C.H. Mason, the man who started, connected with, came to these meetings. He was a close friend and his belief he met with Seymour in Houston, uh, but he would become a great and close friend with Seymour. So there's a lot going on. And what has been holding together, what has been really causing the power has been unity. So I'll let you guess what the enemy came in with, with his attack to stop this thing. Strife. With strife comes every evil thing. And that's what happened. They decided to call on their spiritual father, Charles Parham, to come because they wanted to know they wanted to know if these manifestations were right or wrong. They're receiving a lot of criticism. Um, a lot of people are now coming against. You know, I talked about the people being prepared. You know, Joseph Smell was this Baptist minister, and he prepared the people, and a lot of his people were those that came and really helped start this movement. He would come to the church and invite them to come back, and he would give them freedom. He was a great theologian, but he did not fully agree with tongues, and this wasn't fully the way he saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there were other religious theologians at that time that really started to strongly oppose and come against what was happening in Azusa. Many came curious to criticize, and they would come, and some of them would be changed. 
some of them would feel that their judgment, their criticism was validated based on what they saw. Because you see in this room uh, so much manifestations. People are jerking, jumping, dancing, um, screaming out loud, speaking in tongues. You never knew. Sometimes all of a sudden there would be just an incredible quiet. Every now and then someone would be preaching and all of a sudden the people felt God call an altar call. God would call it and all they would run up to the front and fall like dead people at the altar. So they invite Charles Parham, their spiritual father, to come and, and help them. And because they don't have a lot of experience. And that's one of the things we got to realize that when revival breaks out, a lot of us don't have a lot of experience. And so by looking at revivals of the past and the heroes of the past, I believe we can learn and help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so that we can run with endurance the race He has set before us. So Charles Parham comes, and they're desiring that he would come as a father and help to bring a word of correction and help. But Charles Parham comes, and he is outraged at what he sees. He doesn't like it. In many ways, he has a racist spirit, and he sees, as he would refer to later, white people and black people falling together, and you have this white person being caught by a black person. Just not a good thing. And he sees um, spiritualists in the meeting. He sees familiar spirits. He sees all kinds of things that are wrong. So he sees wrong things, and he sees things that in his mind and his opinion are wrong. And he doesn't believe that this is how the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Well, he didn't bring a father-like message. Instead, he brought a word of harsh discipline, and it was not well received. We don't know the full details of what Parham said, but it's clear based on discussions later on that there were race issues brought up. Again, it's a time of the Jim Crow laws. Well, Seymour padlocks a door so that Charles Parham cannot come back in and they separate. This would be the beginning of a series of separations and divisions and strife entering this fellowship. Other people started to have issues, which so often happens. And this is where you need to have wisdom to lead and be the right voice and bring forth a correction. Because in the group, there was, for example, a Clara Lum, and she would fall in love with Seymour, according to C.H. Mason. C.H. Mason would meet with Seymour, and he said that Seymour confided in him that Clara Lum had fell in love with him and sought C.H. Mason's advice. C.H. Mason said, look, based on the current climate, it is not good for interracial marriage and strongly advises against it. So Seymour pursues that relationship no more, and he would then go on to marry in 1908 um, Jenny Moore, the black lady, of course, that played the piano and would speak and sing in different languages as she played the piano. We don't know if this is fully accurate or not, but Clara Lum would become offended, struggled with this, and would leave. They had started another mission in Portland, and she went to the mission in Portland. At the same time, you've got to realize their holiness message that they're preaching and what Seymour believed in. 
he believed in a sanctification that if you sin, you lost your salvation. He believed in a holiness message, and so did they, and so there were no instruments, for example, in the services. In addition, some believed that because the Lord was coming back so soon, they should avoid certain things like marriage and other social activities. That marriage was of the flesh and a sin because they didn't need it, wasn't necessary because Jesus was coming back. We see that Seymour preached on marriage, uh, I think in like late 1907, and explained that marriage was not a sin and that relations between a man and woman were not a sin in marriage, that it was a good thing. And maybe it was aimed at another lady called Mrs. Crawford. She was a lady of great influence and wealth at the time. She had, of course, been the first white lady to speak in tongues. And at the time, she also got healed. Uh, so again, she wants to get into ministry. She has a burden on her heart and she would teach. But she believes strongly in this message of holiness and that marriage is a sin. She also was probably irritated or upset by Seymour's stance on women. He believed in women in ministry, but with limited authority. He didn't believe that they could ordain or baptize, stuff like that, which I'm sure she desired. Then another offense occurred. A man called Stud would record that they had a need uh, for rent money, and they didn't believe in taking formal offerings. Seymour had always walked by faith, expecting that God would provide every need. It was the same in the church. He didn't take a salary. Sometimes people would stick money in his back pocket. He survived and didn't get a whole lot of money, um, but they had a need, and he was going to take a formal offering this night. And they felt that this had opened the door to the enemy and that God would not be happy with it. Fortunately, Cecil Polhill, the man who would start the Pentecostal Missionary Union in Britain, uh, sent uh, 1,400 pounds to the mission, which was more than enough to meet their need. And they felt this was the Lord saying and, and chastising them for doing this, and that they then became concerned about Seymour's financial leadership. So there's a lot of people now getting offended. At the same time, if I had another thing, Seymour, after Parham leaves, Parham, of course, his doctrine is that the baptism comes with the evidence in speaking in tongues. Seymour starts to preach not at the neglecting of love and that if we receive the Holy Spirit, we should love even more. And he starts to preach that love and the fruit should be the first evidence and that we should stop focusing on the gift and desiring the gift and start focusing on the giver. Well, all these people are coming because they want to hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues. And so now there's another concern. So you have a concern that they might receive an evil spirit, that there's no longer this focus on tongues, um, and there's now strife in the camp. So Mrs. Crawford is invited by Claire Lum to go to Portland. And so she leaves. But when she left, she took with her the mailing list for the newsletter. Now we've got to understand this newsletter, which has now gone global, is their source of, of support and their voice that caused influence and brought people to the mission. People are coming all over the world, are coming, lining up on the streets to get in to see what's going on. So when she went, they now, and Clara Lum was uh, on the board, and so was Mrs. Fletcher. Uh, Clara was the church secretary, and Clara and both of them were highly involved with this newsletter. They knew it inside and out. And so when they went, they continued to create the newsletter, uh, but changed the mailing address to Portland. So now all the funds are going to Portland, all the attention's going to Portland, and they remove Seymour out of it and ultimately even change the name Apostolic Faith. This would be a deadly blow to the revival because now 
you've had a series of events. You've had this strife with Parm. You have this internal strife going on. You have a fear of these devils. And now they don't have the ability to get their uh, support, to get their influence globally. And as a consequence, the numbers start to drop. Well, in 1910, he decides that he's going to go on a traveling tour of America to gain awareness um, and continue to preach this message. He leaves a man called William Durham in charge to preach while he's gone. Now, as I said, Seymour preached a message of um, that if you sinned, you went into the flesh, you lost your salvation. Well, as you can imagine, this was a harsh word that not everybody liked. William Durham believed in the complete work at the cross. And so he's preaching a word that many find refreshing. And in Seymour's absence, as he's preaching, the crowds begin to grow. Once again, the church is packed and hundreds are outside. You can't leave your seat because if you do, it will be taken. The leadership becomes very concerned because they're seeing the crowds but they're also seeing William Durham preach a message which is not in line with William Seymour's doctrine. So they contact William Seymour, who returns, and William Seymour padlocks the door and blocks William Durham from coming back in. Now, the group that would padlock the door were a group of black men, and of course, William Durham was joined by the white people that left. And in many ways, this was the ultimate um, division and separation, which in many ways has continued in the Pentecostal church. William Durham uh, would hold a conference crusade in California where he would bring in Mariah Woolworth Eder, who promised or agreed only to come if they would do a conference on unity but the Seymour and his team never did come. Well, during the next few years, William Seymour's influence would decline and he could go to meetings and he would no longer be recognized or brought up on stage. He would no longer be uh, remembered as the person and people start to forget about Azusa. People did still come to the church, which had dropped about 20 people because they wanted to experience the glorious older days when the Spirit was moving powerfully and to be well received and welcomed. In 1921, William Seymour decided at the age of 51 he would do another tour. And um, it doesn't go as well, so he comes back. He's now worn out and tired. we got to realize certain things, that William Seymour was in his mid-30s at the time of the revival. He was 36. So he's young and inexperienced. And he, did he make mistakes? Yes, he did. He could have been a more voiceful leader and dealt with issues. But I'm also going to say this. He was not a racist. He was a man whose heart was that what the blood of Jesus and what the cross destroyed, the walls, we should not build up again. And he wanted all people to come together and worship, and he understood the power of unity. And so while he could be justified in his resentment towards white, he chose to walk in love. And I think that was the heart that really blessed the Lord, that God used a man that none of us would have qualified, particularly that time period. Blacks were not even second-class citizens in America. I don't know what you would have classified them, but God was making a statement through Azusa that he disagreed with. He was opposed to racism, and God used a black man, raised him up, and used him powerfully as a statement to the church. William Seymour, 
and the rest of them could have dealt with things differently. We look at the word when it talks about strife, and it says the wisdom that's from above is first holy, perfect, um, and it says that it is open to reason. It's reasonable. And that's the part we so often forget. We draw these hard lines in the sand where if you cross this, it's over. And that's really what happened in Azusa Street. They drew these hard lines and they had their beliefs. And it said, if you violate this belief, it's all over. There was no reasoning, talking, getting into the word and working it out and coming to a place where they could even agree to disagree. In the book of Acts, you will see that times they had strong disagreements. And there were strong disagreements, but they could still work together. When we recognize one another and, and people that are those that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, have a personal relationship with them, so we are believers under the blood, then we need to find a way to stop the schisms that I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, and we're always trying to divide. When we look in the context of the gifts, Paul always spoke about unity, one body. This was an area that perhaps Seymour could have changed, and so could have the leaders at that time. These hard lines of uncompromising um, doctrine. This is it or else. So you saw the Azusa Street go into decline, and in 1922, uh, in September, Seymour would take a heart attack. He was told to rest, and he take some time reading, because that's what he did his last year. He spent a lot of time meditating on the Word and reflecting and reading. Unfortunately, that afternoon, around 5 o'clock, he took a second heart attack, and he went home to glory. His wife, Jenny, would take over pastorship of the mission, but shortly after, Seymour's death, they would experience a lot of difficulty as lawsuits would come against them and the city ultimately condemned the building and would tear it down. No Pentecostal denomination that came out and several came out of the Azusa Street Revival stood by and decided to take the building, purchase it and keep it and restore it. So the building was removed and today all that remains is a vacant lot with a sign. In 1936, Jenny would go home to be the Lord as well. So here we see a man that really birthed something of great power by getting people united under the blood of Jesus, removing the barriers of racism. William Seymour sought to emphasize a strong message of love. He was a man that in many ways did walk in a powerful love because of what he went through, and he could have been so resentful and bitter, and he'd been justified in it. But he chose to love. He didn't condemn or criticize or attack. So while he had his weaknesses, there are so many phenomenal strengths in this man, despite what he went through. It was a very difficult, harsh life for him, but he was sold out to the gospel. Like Wesley, he was prepared to pray, to preach, and to die. He was an itinerant minister that was just given all to see souls come to the knowledge of Jesus. His heartbeat was to see people experience the Holy Spirit, not just the gift, but the giver. And he created an environment where the Holy Spirit was able to move wonderfully, powerfully when the church was united. There's so much we can learn from him. And if we desire another Azusa, we've got to discover that we need to lay aside the wrong divisions. If we who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, that have a now relationship, and we are His and we are true believers, would come together under the blood, it's incredible to think what God would do once again. Today, people look back at those glory days. 
but I believe we are on the verge of even something greater. But we can learn from what Seymour did, and we can learn from what happened at the Azusa Street Revival, so that we don't duplicate those mistakes, but we carry that heart of Seymour of prayer, that he's able to stir people to pray long and hard and to be wholly provoked to go into the secret place until God moves again. Well, I pray that this message would bless, encourage, provoke, challenge you, and that you would get a hunger for God even more, that you're just desperate for the Lord and you get into the Word. William Seymour believed strongly in the Word. Those people would often, for example, if somebody had a um, plague trying to come against their field, they would go out and pray, and they would take the Word, and they believed the Word and spoke the Word to stop the plague. They believed in it. The Word had authority, and they believed in that authority in their lives. We must walk the same. There's so much we can learn from that revival. And we can experience that every day in our lives. We need to draw a circle around ourselves and say, God, everything in the circle, revive. Well, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel and check out our other messages on the other heroes of faith and revivals. And I pray that they would just bless you. And I thank you for watching. In the name of Jesus, amen.